Okay. Well, John, good well, afternoon. Welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, getting back on track. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah, it is. It's been, yeah, we've been busy, busy, and yeah, we're happy about that. Yeah, we talked about all that stuff in the last podcast, so, yeah. but whatever. Anyway, we've got another great guest, a yeah. uh, longtime friend, Ron Hulse from Bonafide Antlers. And yeah. we were trying to talk a little bit earlier about how long we've known each other. But it's, it goes back a ways. Yeah. 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 Definitely goes back a ways. Probably I, late 80s, early 90s, I'd yeah. say, for sure. I, yeah. I like the, the, the seasoned hunter. Uh, yes. Because, you know, <laughs> That's where it came all, up. We're all fitting in that, yes. uh, right. in that demographic. How old now. are you? I am 55 55, now. wow. Hard to believe. I didn't even think I'd live this long. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know. Based on what happened in the 80s, it's yeah, surprising, Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, back in the day, somebody that was 55 was like ancient. You right? know? Yeah, it's like, I how know. do you even get out and do anything yeah. anymore? You're so old. You yeah, know? like but. when you're in your 20s and you think of somebody. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Very, yeah, very still, funny. But Still in good shape, though? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. I, You know, I get a lot of exercise at work, unfortunately, but... Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's a good, good. thing. It you is a good to, thing. You want to keep moving and... Yeah, yeah. It's it's important. At our age, absolutely. it's important to right. uh, For sure. stay active. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But I, I appreciate you guys inviting me yeah. today. I'm excited about this. I mean, we yeah. it was... You were like, uh, when we first started, you know, last year, I, I John and I even talked about it. I was mm-hmm. like, we got to get Ron on here because... Um, you know, as as we're getting closer now to shed season, yes, um, you start getting busier. But, yeah, uh, I remember like you were actually you and Terry. Um, we should probably tell friend. everybody what he does. Yeah, oh, yeah, we could start with that. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're going to talk about fishing today, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, no. So my name is Ron Holtz, and uh, I uh, I own Bonafide Antlers in Buell, Idaho, born and raised there. And uh, it started as kind of a small antler business um, 20 years ago, and it's grown into a very large business now. I think uh, the last year and a half, we've been processing about 30,000 pounds of antlers wow. a month. Wow. A month. A month. Wow. Yeah. And so... Probably back then, it was less do... than that per year, huh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it's grown into a big business. And... Um, you know, antlers have treated me good. I've done a lot of other things in the past, but uh, I keep coming back to antlers. And, right. And uh, and now here we are. So. At one point, weren't you, if I remember right, it was like you and another gal from Idaho were like probably the largest Linda. import. Yeah, yeah, Linda. In the uh, world, right? Yeah, at Little Bighorn. And uh, she's, she's, a, she's a great gal and antler crazy like the rest of us. And, yeah. And, of course, Don Schoffler was the kind of the king that got the export market really rolling was he? And, and everything kind of moved out of that you know and and uh it's funny back in the day when i first started picking up antlers this was in the mid to late 80s you know when i really got interested in it i didn't even know you could sell them and um so i am hauling this stuff home i just loved it you know i just you just couldn't get enough of it and yards full of it and stacking up kind of looks like your place your john right <laughs> and uh um, you know, but it was crazy. The amount of antler we were picking at that time. Because no one was doing antler. it. Oh, yeah. And the, the chalk deer antler out in the, these winter ranges, I thought at the time it was, it was endless, that you would never be able to get it picked up. Um, because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't taking the backpack and going for a walk and, you know, pick it up. It was literally pulling the truck up, walking out through the brush, making a loop back to the truck with an old <laughs> antlers, throwing it in, pulling wow. the truck on up. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And it was mostly all chalk. Was it? But it was, uh, it was everywhere. Mm. And probably, you know, from those heyday years of the 50s and 60s, um, when those deer were at peak populations. And, you know, today, a lot of the places where we were picking up those sheds then, um, they don't even winter there now. Really? Um, you know, the herds, everything's changed. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and, and back then there wasn't a lot of elk. You know, people don't realize that, but the elk numbers were, were not great. Really? And uh, it wasn't until, you know, the, the, the 90s, really, when the elk numbers really started to flourish. Huh. And, uh, hmm. and then we were like, well, we got to find out where all these elk are at. You know, as, as Nevada's elk herds are, are starting to increase, uh, oh, increase yeah, yeah. in population. And, and so it took a little, little footwork. And, and, you uh, guys hit that. And then we just hit it right. Yeah, it was some crazy years. I remember yeah. seeing you come through. So I, I live in Filer. <laughs> and you have to go through Filer from Nevada to get the Buell. Right. And seeing this is before. I mean, I knew Ron, but I actually didn't know that was Ron. And I'd see this truckloads of the back of the truck, a trailer, (laughs) 
just, I mean, stacked above the cab. Yes, the browns, insane. you know, it of was elk. Insane. Yeah, and then uh, and then come to find out, he had a mutual friend that he was actually shed hunting with, and he's telling me that he's going with Ron, and they were doing the Nevada thing, blah blah blah. Back then, there was no regulations, no seasons no. or anything, so it was like yeah, whatever. But you it guys, it was a free for all. But Terry Terry Williamson was just a great guy. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah. we kind of were going in the same areas. A lot, and we were, you know, I was seeing his boot tracks, and he was oh, seeing my boot tracks. So you didn't start off and together. So we didn't start off together. That's and funny. Uh, and then he left a note on my vehicle one time, and he says, "We need to talk." And uh, <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, we do." And uh, oh, okay. and we just started a, just a great friendship yeah. from that point on. And both our mothers were 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 happy because we go out in this wilderness areas by ourselves, right. and uh, and now we could actually go together. Gotcha. And uh, so it, it really turned into a great friendship and a great partnership. So back then, was it kind of, uh, um, you know, and, and, and Terry told me, but I certainly didn't go tell everyone, oh, yeah, yeah they're going down yeah. to Nevada. But was it kind of a hush-hush thing back it, then? We, we learned to keep it kind of quiet. As we started getting more and more antler, it started mm -hmm. to draw more and more attention. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, the amount of volume of antler was hard to hide it. You know, these days, yeah. I recommend a guy, you know, you catch a mantler, just put them inside your truck and, you know, cut exactly. throw a jacket over them yeah. or something, you yeah. know. And you don't want anybody to see that you've yeah. been coming out of an area. Back then, it was, it, you know, there just wasn't that many people interested. And so, you know, we just kind of pile it on and, and you were getting so much of you it. You couldn't help. You couldn't help but to expose it's something. like yours. Yeah. And, and uh, but then, you know, we over the years, we got a little more... Uh, secretive over it and and Do you have uh, people fall on you and stuff yeah it's it's you know it's like a good fishing hole yeah. you know and and uh when you start bringing that stuff in and guys guys were starting to get a little more interest in it mm -hmm. and um you know and like i said when i first started early back mid 80s late 80s um you know i didn't know you could sell the stuff and um and i didn't for quite some time i was just dragging home and uh i just loved it and uh then um, I met a guy, or I got a hold of a guy that was in Chalice, Idaho, that was buying antler, and he was buying for Don Schaffler for the export market at the time. And where's Don from? Don's out of Ennis, Montana. Okay. Yeah, or that's what he was based out of. Okay. And uh, anyway, so I got a hold of this guy, and he says, "Yeah, it was like I don't know, two dollars a pound or something." He says, "You know, you can bring bring some antler." I'm like, well, "How much antler can I bring?" And, and he's like, "Well, how much do you got?" And I said, "Well, if I can get my buddy, his truck, my truck, you know, we'll we'll pile it up and and we'll come up." I was so excited, and and. Uh, Anyways, went up, started selling him antler, and uh, did you blow his mind when you showed up? Oh yeah, up? it was it was a lot of antler, and I'm like, how soon can I come back? And, <laughs> and uh, you know, it was I thought I'd hit the lottery, really. Yeah. And uh, so, and the funny thing is, I sold antler to a number of people for a lot of years, and, and when we were we were picking a lot of antler. You know, if I had to guess, I would guess some years I picked up three to five thousand pounds of this stuff Jeez. annually, and it wasn't worth much, you right. know, But it but it was it was a lot. Yeah. And and I really dedicated a lot of time to doing it. Yeah. And uh, um, and I sold antlers to a lot of people within the industry. And it was interesting now that my business, once I finally got into this business and, and, and built such a big business, most of the people that are still in the business that I used to sell antler to now, I buy all their antler. Really? So it's wow. kind of come full circle. Right. And, because uh, Is it because you kind of took the initiative to, for lack of better words, get bigger? And they didn't yeah. want to get to that. And you know, it was it was just I think just implementing some good business practices, okay. you know, treating everybody. It was it's kind of a it's an interesting uh, niche of people, and mm -hmm. um, kind you know of a small some world. people yeah some people were a little more uh, um, oh I would say honest than others, and yeah. uh, so I just ended up you know just uh, kind of treating everybody good and and my business just grew and and we took advantages of some markets you know say after the 2008 uh, period when uh, you know a lot of this was ornamental at that time mm -hmm. and uh and, it, and obviously the export market as well yeah um the dog juke market kind of came out of that oh, and okay. people were looking for a place to go with deer antler at the time because the the economy was kind of bad and uh the 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 yeah. Antlers, chandeliers, the lamps kind yeah. of dried up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And of course, the deer antler is a great chew, but the elk antler is is the highest um, amount of marrow in okay. an antler. So it's the premium chew. And so, of course, what the Asians wanted, 
the dog chew market kind of wanted to, and, and, and that's the largest portion that goes into the dog chew market now is, is, oh. that, uh, is that elk antler. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and is anyone any better, um, like money-wise, is the import or export still better than? No, the export, you know, we, we export a lot of our chalk, our waste, um, okay. you know, the stuff we don't put into the dog chew market. Okay. Um, so uh, we export the trim, everything but the powder. Um, the powder stays here. We generate quite a bit of power off our saws, and and uh, the reason it doesn't yeah. go to China is because they don't they don't trust it because it, they need to see it in whole form, right? Gotcha. Um, as you can imagine, if we were buying powder from China, they would probably be sending us everything, um, dirt, salt, anything sure. but antler powder, and they right. assume they that we would do, they assume that we thing. would do the same to them, yeah. and so they like to see it whole. Gotcha. And, uh, uh, what, what, what do you do with powder? Yeah. That's interesting. So we are holding it. a lot of our powder. We okay. probably have 40,000 plus pounds of powder <laughs> stored up. We get about 2.5% off of our saw. So if we cut 100,000 pounds of handler, that's about 2,500 pounds of, huh. of powder. We collect it. It's a good ingredient. It's it's a good item. We do have one item. We put it into a biscuit. Um, but, uh, hmm. but for the most part... Um, you know, we, we're, we need to build enough of it. You know, I've got a client out there that would probably take 100,000 pounds of it a year. Well, we would have to generate that out of from our export scrap and stuff. We would have to actually produce the, the powder. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's not cost effective at this point. Right. You know? It's, it's not kind of thing to happen with it's that. It's kind of a part. byproduct. Yeah, it's a byproduct. Um, but uh, they want it relatively cheap. And, and it would be hard to produce it outside of what sure. we take off our Right. Uh, that's oh, interesting. Yeah. I never thought about the powder. Me, yeah, well, that's but you cool. know it's there. I mean, it's... It is. And so there's really no waste. Um, you know, we collect everything, the the, the trim and, and uh, like I said, the, the lower grade stuff all go to China. Um, goes into the human pharmaceutical market over mm-hmm. there. Yeah, so you yeah, say lower grade, like the chalk and mm-hmm. stuff you're talking about? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. And, um, and they'll use it for joint health, arthritis, yeah. you know, the same benefits the dogs get out of it. Huh. Um, and uh, so... It's a, and it's a natural, natural it's a remedy. Natural remedy, things. yeah. It's kind of a vessel expander. You know, the, the the press. Everybody says, oh, it's an aphrodisiac. It's really not used for an aphrodisiac at all. It's it's morally for that that uh, uh, joint health, healing, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Huh. It's what it's been. That's interesting. Yeah, huh. and it's been being consumed for a long time. So sure. we still we still ship a lot of antlers over to the Asian pharmaceutical market. So do you ship them? I I guess I didn't realize you guys actually cut them up there. Mm-hmm. I just thought you sent whole. Do you cut them into dog cheese and we do. whatever they're going to be right there we, on the spot? We, for the last year and a half, we've been processing almost three thirty thousand pounds a month okay. of dog cheese, Jeez. and uh, it's a it's a it's a crazy number, yeah. it really is. And uh, the handling, the, the logistics of it, and that's why, you know, I stay in good shape. Is we literally we're handling millions of pounds of antler a year, right? Yeah. And it's it's a little overwhelming at times. Oh, going in your warehouse. Have you been to his warehouse? I need to do that. You do, John. I, the, you oh, need man. To come the by. whole time we're ta- we've been talking so far, I was like, man, we just need to go do a video there and walk around the... We should. It's, if it's you insane. let us do that, oh, yeah, would be Could we do that? that like, awesome. I'll just download the podcast. You're just more than welcome. Pe- people, yeah. I mean, like I says, until you go over there, and I don't know if I've even went at peak times where before you shipped or whatever, but yeah. I'm assuming it's pretty... It's it's yeah. crazy right now. I think the end of the year we had about three point one million in inventory over there. So it was, uh, which is a lot. And, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we're breaking it down pretty fast, and when it's broke down, we can put it in smaller areas and mm-hmm. stuff. But there's exactly. a lot of antler it's there. Just it's constantly and coming. And, yeah. Right. And At, let alone his head collection that he has. There. There's a lot I've of taxidermy of there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a there's a crazy amount of taxidermy. I, I encourage anybody if they're in the area to stop by. And, mm. You know, you don't need to be getting dog chews or sell antlers. It's, you know, it's just something to see. Yeah. And if you're an antler enthusiast, yeah, it's like. You know, I mean, you can't. You can't definitely put it. And those mounts are a lot of those your personals, or yeah, there's a lot of personal mounts in there as well. But a lot of it was business stuff. I used to do a lot of business with Cabela's and Bass Pro, Pro and Sportsman's oh, Warehouse. That's right, filler. And you did. Uh, you yeah. also oh. did. Uh, I did rest locus. Yeah, you did, for a lot of years. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that, um, that wild boar. Yeah. 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 yeah you did. Um, yeah, we. I used to do a lot of business with them when they were first opening up stores. Um, and they were all, you know, when, when Sportsman's Warehouse kind of was threatening going back east and uh, Dick Cabela's and, and Bass Pro, I mean, they, they were like, hey, who is this guy? And we're going to start we're going to start grabbing a lot of this property. And so they were literally opening stores, you know, a lot of brick and mortar stores right. for, yeah. there for a while. And yeah. They were looking for filler. And uh, we got in touch with a guy from Cabela's and uh, it was a taxidermy purchaser. And 
that Cabela's loved, you know, we would kind of put in bigger antlers or, you know, uh, shed sets or whatever. And we, we do a lot of uh, pseudo taxidermy. We kind of gussy up some mounts and they were fine mm -hmm. with that. Bass Pro, they wanted all new taxidermy. Uh -huh. And so they would go out and kind of lowball some of these new taxidermists and, uh, and and get everything done. So for them, we supplied shed sets and and racks and stuff oh, okay. like that. And okay. uh, it was a lot of volume. Yeah. And uh, but then, you know, now Bass Pro owns the whole the whole thing, right. really. And uh, um, but nobody's really building the brick and mortar stores. The online presence is really you mm -hmm. know, yeah yeah, is yeah really yeah. big. That's true. Doing that, and it makes yeah. sense. You yeah. Know? So that that kind of phased itself out. And so then I've got just kind of an overabundance of taxidermy left, and I still am a. I still buy used taxidermy, and you know, yeah. it's, it's horrible. But I, I, we just, and you'll see if you come over, it's like, oh, what is this guy thinking? You right. know? He's got some pretty, pretty impressive. There is. There's some real good trophy stuff there too. You know. So is there um, still a market for the, lar or do you even keep the larger sheds? Do you separate those yeah, out, or how's yeah, that? Yeah, you know, not, not so much on the wild elk. The wild elk. Got ya. Um, we cut a lot of big wild elk. There's yeah. still some big wild elk out there, but the ranch stuff kind of wrecked that market. That's uh, true. And mm -hmm. um, you know, it wrecked it on the white tail side of it too yep. um it's kind of you know the mule deer market is 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 really strong um meaning the trophy side of that yeah. just because mm -hmm. it's a supply and demand but mm -hmm. they're having some pretty good success at ranching mule deer in yeah, mexico that's what and, I heard mexico and so. um yeah in fact that whole place is going to be high fence before we know it really and um it's i sad. wondered that because i i've started hearing more things about the last 10 years yeah. you're hearing more and more about it and you know, I'm sure you've. I know you've been down there before. I have, yeah. When I was guiding down there, they were talking about it at that time. Yes. And that's been quite a few years. Yeah, it's that. it's it's making a rapid move that direction. Oh. And um, yeah, it's sad to see too. It is right. Long gone are the good old days. Of because going out. it's it then it becomes a money thing. It does. And the outfitters, you know, the money, the landowners, you know, they're all in cahoots, and and in order to produce big deer. Um, regularly, that was what the demand is. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the ranching side of it has, has kind of sprung up. And not too many places in the world you can fence that kind of amount of ground right. and afford to do it. And they control the water so they can control the movement of the deer and stuff. And so, hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's like anything. It's yeah. Almost like yeah. You're you know, you're, you're pretty soon everybody, you know, go shoot a 200 inch deer. Yeah. You know, it's kind, of, it's kind of wrong, but it's, right. I get it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I do have a friend who, who's wanted to shoot a 200-inch whitetail forever, and he finally just saved up, yeah. and dropped the money, and, yeah. and living out here, out west, you know, yes. to go to go back east you, might take you, who knows? Who knows how long? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, now, you know, those hunts are getting more affordable all the time, yeah. you know, the estate hunts. Yeah. And... Uh, and and guys are opting to do that as opposed to you know if you go to Canada maybe you sit up there in Saskatchewan or um, British Columbia for ten days freezing to death yeah. and maybe you'll see a big deer maybe, maybe you won't yeah. you know and so a lot of guys just like with the elk thing too you know a lot of guys have have don't have a lot of time and yep. have an interest in a hunt and you know unfortunately that's kind of where we've got yeah so the uh, the ranch bulls. I know Idaho still does have a couple places, don't they? They do, yeah. They shoot a lot of bulls, yeah. And yeah. So I, I've never, um, you know, I've only been around a little bit of stuff in Texas, high fence, but some of those places are several, they're thousands of acres, aren't they? Yeah. Is it, I know they can't leave the fence, but are they like hit, in your opinion, do you think, are they hitting fences? And turn it around, or a lot of them just living in the middle. I anyway. think they're living in the middle for most of that. You know, they may be raised in a in a corral or something. You know, a little more confined, and then they're kind of turned out. Yeah. Gotcha. You. And and so, you know, but one thing it seems like their antlers just always look different. They do. You know, the genetics. A lot of them are the Manitoban strain still, and yeah. and so they're they're you know big non typical. They're trying to breed that out. You know, they're trying to breed. <laughs> Uh, in a more six. big typical, yeah. um, you know, both on the whitetail and the, the, the elk okay. and to make them look more, more wild, but they're just so freaking huge. Yeah. Right. Um, wow. And so look at the elk farm we had here by Filer. Yeah. I mean, those yeah. bulls out there were insane. Yeah. Oh. yeah. 
Well, this kind of took a different turn there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. We go, to, we we go just, down a rabbit hole everywhere. We yeah. just BS. Yeah, it tends to happen a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. We never end up where Absolutely. we intend, for sure. Oh, I can't <laughs> tell you how many times we've started. We're going to talk about this. Right. Yeah. And we don't. Oh, well, that's but, the great thing about conversation. Yeah. Huh? And, that, and the hunters, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, we can, we're, we're professional BSers. So, right. you know, we can. Seasoned. Yeah, seasoned. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. We got a lot of stories these uh, days. Uh, so, that's awesome. Yeah. Speaking of which, I mean, do you, you find yourself hunting less because of I do. Time. Um, time. You know, uh, I caution guys of turning their hobby into, right. a, into a business. And, when is uh, your peak? Like, when is your busiest? It used to be through the summer months. But, okay. you know, we do such a big volume of antler now that uh, it never really busy. slows down. Oh. And so the influx of antler is continuous. And uh, So that you get them in year-round? We get you? them in year-round. We yeah. purchase year-round. Our pipeline through our dealer system is so big that it never stops it's interesting well in reality i mean we were gonna we talked about i talked to ron about doing podcasts couple two three weeks ago something like that mm-hmm. and you were waiting for a call for a shipment from from alaska, alaska. big load of moose coming yeah. in from alaska really? yeah. so that's, that's why we did a, why we postponed yeah it. that's yeah. cool i used to you know i used to be able to spend 100 days hunting big game oh, you, and, you and were 50 gone. 60 days a year hunting sheds and mm-hmm. life was i was what i called a professional vocational recreation <laughs> Nobody felt sorry for me. I, right. I just, you know, and I didn't make much money. Sure. I, I just, uh, you know, I just had uh, I had a really good quality of life. And, and then I I got this, turned it into a business, and, and it was quite successful. And, um, you know, and we've, we've, we're probably, we're the largest processor of, of antlers. Are you? And, and we probably do as much or more volume than anybody else in the country. Wow. And, That's And, awesome. um, and so, but it came That's at a cost. That's off to you, man. For, it came at a cost, yeah. you know. And yeah. so now... I'm lucky to get out much, and um, and you used to do a lot of out of state. I know. And I did, yeah, and I still would. Again, those tags are getting tougher and yeah. tougher to get. Mm-hmm. You know, so you got to pay the bonus point system, right? And you hope your number comes up, and you know, not too many numbers at once. I and just, uh, it's the game, I, yeah. Talking, um, and I know that I've talked about this before, but Ron and I met like in a gas station. He was coming back. I'm quite sure it's from. Wyoming, and I don't know Could where been, I was yeah. going to, but yeah, he was coming back from an early hunt, but running into somebody, running yeah, into each other, yeah, yeah. yeah. both cool. stopped to take a leak or something, yeah. it's like, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've known, I was trying to think that on the way over here today, how long we've known each other, but yeah, it's, it's a long time, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and, and knowing of each other, and of course, John, I've I've heard your name in many circles. I can't believe that we just haven't right. really crossed paths. Yeah, that is funny. Yeah. Huh. It's interesting. We'll have to make sure that happens. You guys got to come over to the show. I want to. Yeah. Uh, that yeah, like we'll I go just get said. Some video and stuff yeah, absolutely. Of, just kind of do a, a walk. It's around. a must see. It's nuts. Yeah, I try to tell people. You try to prepare people for it, and, and you just can't. You yeah, know, you just come in, and you're like, what? It's it's it, it still amazes me. I am in there every day. Right. You know, I walk in there. And I'm like. So it sounds like on? you're a hands on. I mean, like. Uh, oh yeah. You're always hands on and. Yeah. And, How many yeah, employees I, you have? So we've got seven people all together, and I got some great people. You know, and my manager, my shop manager there is a, is one of my best friends. And, Greg. And Greg. Yeah. yeah. And we went to school together, and and we worked together at Clear Springs, and and. Uh, you know, and we get to spend every day together now, and and uh, it's just a great relationship, and yeah. he, he's just a great guy. Yeah, he so is. you know, that's that's a real blessing to have a business like this and to have good people. Mm-hmm. You're still um, small enough, but yeah, yeah, you're obviously doing large numbers. But we so. are. We we do we do uh, um, we do a high volume, low margin. Oh. Which in the beginning I thought, well, this is the way to go. We're going to do a lot of antler and just make a little bit on it, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I think, man, that was really wrong. <laughs> you know, we should have it turned into a lot of work. We should have we, we should have done a more uh, lower volume, higher margin type of business. Well, that probably grew your business, though. It did. You know, I mean, yeah. it's definitely a different. Um, you know, my real job. That's how that we yeah. operate is low margin, and it we is. just sell volumes of stuff. Yeah, and yeah. there's something to be said for that. And the but. model works, but it's 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 a lot of work. Yeah, you know, um, and that's the thing with the antlers is. Is we're literally handling. You know, these antlers come from all over North America and in Canada, and um, typically they're brought down in horse trailers, cargo trailers, right. you know, what have you. And uh, they've been handled like I 
don't know how many times to get that to that point. It's true. Yeah. Then we have to handle them. Um, we unload, grade everything. It gets put on pallets. Yeah, and, and, I was going to ask and you. We that. we pallet put everything on a pallet so that we can move it around. Don't have to handle it again because the handling is just it's crazy. Yeah, I remember when I took uh, last year or year before when I took a bunch I had in, in the shed, and uh, and how you sort them. I never really knew, but he yeah. was like. Yeah, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there, and you just had different piles and cut up the ones with skulls on them, and uh, so yeah, it was. It was it, it's uh, yeah, everything's bought by the pound except for the trophy stuff, and then uh, um, you know it's bought by the grade, it's bought oh, by the species. It? Oh, right. So every species has a little bit different price point, you mm -hmm. know, and, and obviously the the elk is the premium consumption item so it draws the premium price right is it pretty much deer and elk all you're handling or do you do no we do a lot of moose do you, as well okay, moose, uh, yeah. we, we do get some exotics in stuff like that Sheep. um we yeah you know occasionally um but uh you know for resale or for for decor mm -hmm. and um is that where the moose goes usually the moose uh we do a lot of we cut a lot of moose yeah. and uh hmm. it's a real popular item with the dogs as well the oh. moose antler has a it's kind of a different odor, you know. It's a different, it's a different texture all the way around. The billets are super hard and uh -huh. super dense, and the hmm. palms are pretty soft, yeah, and really oh. pliable. So for older dogs and, and less aggressive, gotcha. dogs, the palm is a great chew. And huh. something about the moose, these the, the dogs, they just really like it. Yeah. And and there's a little different odor to it, even though it's more or less odorless. It's it's just different to them. Yeah. Price, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, are you? Are you like in a lots of different chain stores or? We are, we, we, you know, I started, when I when I started the antler chew side of it, I started a company which is basically a label and uh, Bucky Bites and uh, I started with a few partners and um, and then, you know, we had that going and then, but the bulk share of it, what Bonafide Antlers does is we do a lot of private labels. Um, okay. And so most of our product goes out, and you'll see it in a store under somebody else's yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And uh, so we do a lot of bulk, um, private. And you put. Label. Uh, okay, so it's bulk, so you're not packaging it for someone We're else. We're not. We do a lot of. Uh, some of it's sold by the pound. Some of it's sold by the piece. Gotcha. And um, and uh, we do. It's it's a lot. It's a lot of items. And uh, so it's just the volume is so do you package them like as a cell we, unit or we do, do we do, do the whole thing we do package some okay. antler there um a lot of it gets packaged at other sources under their own label so okay. you yeah. know we're in a lot of big national retail stores yeah, out yeah. there but um that product would be under someone else's label mm -hmm. so, yeah. you know and again hence but you don't the, package for them they do we their do. Own. yeah okay. the the high volume low margin yeah you know it's kind of our our model Absolutely, good or yeah. bad but uh, right we're, we're riding it to the dirt you right. know i mean it's it's getting tougher and tougher it really is, it? is. Hmm. yeah you know i don't see no s slowing down as far as people shed up because it has become so popular that yeah i mean people don't go out even remotely like you guys used to go out i don't hear that there, Do you? there's some hardcore guys the thing about it for me is is uh you know i can't Physically, I can't compete with these guys anymore. Right. You know, I mean, they, they, there's guys I know that'll go out and put in 20 miles in a day in hard, you know, lava country, it's floppy, you know, and find two or three antlers and they think they've had a great day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't even imagine, you know, doing, putting that much effort in for, for two or three well, antlers. Like you were exactly. saying before, you'd make a loop. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was a different, it was different back then. Yeah. I still love to get out mm -hmm. and, and there is still something, no matter how many antlers I've found in my life. When you glass, and you know this, John, when yeah. you glass that antler on the hillside across there, it's exciting. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's adrenaline. Addicting. And, um, it's a drug. And to this day, you know, I get excited and a little raghorn or something. Right. I was like, oh, there's an antler, you know. And, and then, of course, you think in this day and age, back in the day, you wouldn't worry about, oh, I'll get over there in an hour or two hours or so and scoop that up on this. Now you, you race right over there and pick it up because you're afraid somebody's going to come over the hill yeah. and right. beat you to it. You right. know? And, and you do hear stories of yeah, that. Yeah. So, it's a different it's a different deal out there and and it's and I can't blame anybody for going out and picking up antlers right um, it's fun yeah the problem with that is is if it takes a toll on a resource mm -hmm. we've got to make some changes uh, yeah, that's yeah. Where we're at now. you hear to the you hear the like Nevada I know they have a season and you hear mm -hmm. about I've heard it seen it on social media where people are out there prematurely yeah. and then they're going in places with vehicles 
they're not supposed to be and you get those guys there and it's like why can't you do it legit yeah That's well the, it's you know it yes yeah, it's, it's it's a it's an issue and it's an issue we're all going to have to address absolutely and, and um and for me in my business, I want as many healthy animals out there. I want as many animals to carry through the winter and, and shed those antlers. And I want our herds to be prosperous. And, and, and when the thing we love the most is, is damaging that, mm -hmm. um, we have to really step back and look at, okay, what do we need to do here? And we're at that point. You know, social media has really just kind of ramped this thing up. Yeah. And, and a lot of states, you know, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Nevada, you know, they, they've gone to a shed season. And I'm not a big fan of the seasons just for the reason you were talking about. Um, it kind of favors the guy because it doesn't keep anybody from being out there. That's yeah. exactly, um, exactly right. Yeah. And, and the problem is it's the guy that's willing to, to break the rules, it benefits them. The guy that sits at home and waits and gets out there. And I can see the frustration. Right. The um, other thing I see is, and I know we actually have talked about this in past podcasts last year, is the guys who are almost pushing the herds mm -hmm. because they're waiting for the antlers when... That time of year, depending on the weather, could be one of the most vulnerable times of the year if we get a cold snap or whatever. It is no doubt the most vulnerable time of the year for, for wild game, period. Yeah. Um, you know, they're at their weakest points. Yeah. And, um, and that transition from feed, from their winter feed to their spring feed, and it's, it's a very vulnerable time. That's gone. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. I mean, they're just hanging by a thread. Yeah. Right. And, and so... You know, and, and a lot of these people, they have good intentions, maybe. They just maybe don't understand. I get I get a lot of people that will say, oh, my God, we saw, you know, 300 head of elk yeah. out there. And most of them, the antlers had already came off. And this is like early February. And and, and they're thinking they're bulls and, that, you know, these things. And, they, and, and so there's... I think a lot of the key is going to be education. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I talk to these ranchers out there and they say, hey, man, we're having more trouble in the spring with the shed hunters than we've ever had with the hunters in the fall. Right? Really? And opening and the, gate, leaving gates open. Yeah, and trash and, you know, and just, just, just simple things that as a hunter, you yeah. know, you know and you recognize that this is the way and you treat private land just like you treat public land. Right. And, you know, yeah. it's all, it's, you know, we try to go out there and make it better. And, but a lot of these people, and they're zealous to get out there, and, and a lot of them aren't sportsmen. Um, they're interested in the outdoors, but right. they haven't spent a lot of time in the outdoors. Right. And so I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done. I think a lot of these people, they see it on social media. They, they have a side-by-side. -side. Their right. friends went out and picked a few antlers, and they think it looks like fun, and it, and it is. But they don't realize the damage or the danger that they're doing. And so, you know, Utah did an online deal where you get a permit. That You don't have to cost anything for the permit, but you have to go online, and, and they kind of give you some ethics and, and some stuff. I think, think that's a, that? I think that's a good direction. You yeah. know, I think I think some of these people really need to be, you know, you're always going to have bad apples. Sure. Right. And they don't care. Right. And they're going to break the rules and they're going to do the things they shouldn't do. And, and it's ego, unfortunately, that drives 100%. them. hundred percent. It's not, it's not the price of antlers. It's, it's, I'm going to get the biggest, the most, and look at what I've done. Mm -hmm. And, and that really rears an ugly head out there. And, and these are the guys that really, the guys that are, have influence on people are the guys that really need to be maybe changing the culture. I mean, you know, back in the day, um, in the 60s and 70s, you know, I mean, the spotlighting, the poaching, the party hunting, it's yeah. kind of accepted, culturally accepted. Yeah. Nobody just said anything, you know, and it was very unfortunate. But over time, that culture changed and, and people started to speak out and they mm -hmm. started to, you know, uh, self-police themselves. Some. Yeah. And I think the shed, the shed side of it, these shed hunters kind of have to do the same thing. I, I think have it's, to. A, it's a change of uh, in the community that if you see something that's not right, you know, um, you know, speak out. Yeah. It else. is well, frustrating. Any, but anybody with a social media presence that does shed hunt needs to be I, that spokesperson. I think they need to be an advocate. Yeah, and, 100%. And, um, yeah. and we, you know, it's a great renewable resource when done correctly. Right. Um, and we don't want to lose that ability to do that. You don't want the BLM and the Forest Service coming in and making the rules and regulations. Right. 100%. You know, the game agencies are probably the best ones to do that. Now, the other side of that is 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 the teeth in the in, in the laws. You See, know? that's I'm uh, sorry. I'm good, it's a yeah, big, it's I a get big... fired up about this subject all the time. But, well, it is. but really, like I agree with you 100. percent It's like if you're going to make the, the freaking rules, which is fine. I mean, yeah. sometimes I almost feel like they need to have that. 
But you better have the resources to enforce it, or yeah. you're just keeping the, the honest people honest. You're not right. making a dent in the issue. That's kind of what we're seeing right now. We need that to kind of probably change yeah. to where to where maybe. But the problem is that you've got to get the judges and the prosecutors convinced. That this is a crime, right? Well, and, and on and top of that, you got to have people in the field, right? To catch them, because it when starts you have, there, in my opinion, it, one you, fishing you game officer first. for thousands and thousands, right. or, or hundreds and hundreds of miles, yeah. they can't be right. And, and let's yeah. face it, shed season. It's very is, difficult. It's it's a short enough time that they got to be so many different places. Right. It's really unfortunate that um, you know they they have so few. Um, Fishing awesome. game officers. It is, right. and it's always been that way. You right. know, on the hunting side of it, it's the same way. And yeah. I know the game agencies, they're, they're like, oh, God, this is the last thing we want to have to deal with in the yeah. spring. Exactly. The research is already stretched thin. Right. However, you can't give somebody a $90 ticket for going off-road or picking up an antler out of season when that antler is worth $120. Right. You know, I mean. Exactly right, yeah. So, But if that vehicle or that side-by-side -side gets confiscated or, or mm -hmm. you know. True, I true. Mean, if something true. more serious yeah. can be done, that's going to help get weed some of those bad yeah, apples that's out. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, There's nothing more frustrating yeah. than, than doing the right thing, let's say hiking back there. Right. Uh, whatever. And then running across four-wheeler tracks or and nothing against those Absolutely. people that have them yep. as long as they use them right, right. but have them go in some place that they're not supposed to or yeah. even vehicles well yeah and it, and and that's and that's a thing too like with deer you know if you're out on the winter range and you're out there and and you see some deer and you go the other direction and and you you know they may get bumped a little bit deer are going to settle down they're going to run around the hill and stalk right but if they hear that side by side or that four wheeler i mean they they're they're panicked and they're and they're they've been conditioned and the mm -hmm. elk unfortunately you know, they, they don't just run around the hill. They run 10 miles. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they run into another one. Mm -hmm. And they run 10 miles more. That's true. And, and so that that is really creating a problem. Right. And when you've got herds that well, never get a, a Once again, irritating. Lives. They'll shut the roads down during that time of year, which I absolutely think they should do. Yeah, I do, no, too. But they got to enforce it because it's not... I can't tell you how many times I go out <laughs> shed out and I freaking stop at the sign and start walking. And there's still tracks on the road just yeah. going yeah it's irritating it is irritating yeah and and i think you know for the most part most of it just like anything there's a few bad apples out there right and uh um, it takes and it kind of ruins it for everybody yeah. and mm -hmm. i know you know the ranchers the private land there's a lot of private land out there mm -hmm. in the spring you know they don't want to get out there a little later with their cows and see the roads all torn oh, up and, and garbage you know, everywhere. yeah and fences you know that were supposed to be shut or are strung open mm -hmm. and, and uh, so there's issues and um, and the shed hunting community, we're going to face these, and, and and we have to do what's right by the resource, um, first and foremost, um, and that is you know the the the, the land, the, the the you know when you get people out cross country and doing these things, it's mm -hmm. hard on you know critical wintering areas and stuff, um, but we got to really protect that resource, and I think we have to do it as a community. Um, and we have to change the culture. And now that we're going to see, unfortunately, I think, you know, I think seasons are, are coming. Yep. And yeah, uh, I, I think maybe it. even a license or permitted type of thing is yep. coming. They've got to raise some revenue out of this yep. um, to pay for the enforcement, which I'm not opposed to. Right. I, I, don't like, I don't like government, <laughs> but in this case, yeah. we have to step in. And, and because you don't want to wait too long and, and have those reverse effects right. on that. No, on I agree. That. I hate the whole, you know, raising more money to do that stuff too. But it, it, if you're the guy out there doing it, you realize it needs to be done. You do. You know, I yeah. mean, and something's got to change. Yeah, it. You know, and and the cheaters. You know, there, there's always going to be those guys. Yeah. yeah. But They're if the climate be. changes to where it's less tolerated, um, and uh, like you said, they get something confiscated. They I'm get something a big believer really hurts. in splitting some teeth in this. Yeah. Right. You know, you got to get the prosecutors. You got to get the judges. Right. To follow through on that, and, and they have a hard time, and they don't understand. You know, it's just a few antlers, and you know, we've got people out here that get drug addiction and right. theft and stuff like that. But it's more than that. You know, um, it's it's not just a few antlers. Mm -hmm. It's 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 robbing an opportunity from other people, and it's basically well, it's stealing the health from of our the resources. animal as it's well. It's the health of the animal. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, you know that's the that's the the thing we have to protect the most. Yeah, I got a question because you were talking about handling. You know, they get handled so much all over. When COVID was around, mm -hmm. don't want to get into too much of that. Right, but, right. But was that uh, issues at all with exporting or moving around and stuff um, for you guys? You know, it it 
it was um, a little bit on the export end. There was some issues there. We have to kind of sanitize. Still to this day, we still sanitize some antler you know, yeah. going to China and stuff like that. Um, but we were deemed essential. And so the pet industry, really? so we never slowed down. Ah. And, and, but, the, but COVID changed. Uh, it definitely increased the number of shed hunters I bet. dramatically. Because uh, people were something. looking for a way to get out. Yeah. And, and they were exposed to this and they thought, oh, this is fantastic. I mean, let's get out and do some hiking and, and stuff. And so through those COVID, through those lockdowns, we actually saw the numbers of people out. Like the Nevada shed season a few years back, I went down there and uh, I mean, it was kind of crickets. There was hardly anybody out there. I, huh. I think a lot of guys had already picked all their antler mm-hmm. and gone home, but, but, <laughs> but then during those COVID years, I mean, it was like, it was crazy the really? number of people and, and, and were it was out. worse than I, I, cause I experienced this myself. Yeah. It was worse than hunting season. It was May 1st in Nevada is, was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Kids, is campers, May 1st? camps. Yeah. Really? Vehicles everywhere, yeah. dogs running around. Well, that's I mean, part was, of why I'm kind of opposed to seasons because you shove all those people into the same spot at the same time. Yeah. And there's going to be, you know, issues that way too. There is. I, you know, there's there's no one great solution. No. Hopefully, right. there's a number of of things that we can help. You know, um, curb the. I wouldn't say the enthusiasm, mm-hmm. but just educate that enthusiasm, mm-hmm. and maybe because you know you, you really have to make a plea for our for our game animals. Yeah. I mean, these are the ones, and they have suffered impacts. Yeah. Um, and the thing we love the most shouldn't hurt the thing we love the most. Yeah. Right, true. And, I know, hundred uh, percent. So true. we really have to be mindful of that, and I think it's going to be a challenge going forward. But I'm with you, John. I think the influencers out there right. really need to be preaching this right. and um, and teaching this, especially yeah. to young people and new people. hundred um, percent. I do a lot of shed hunting videos on my YouTube channel, and, and every chance I get, I'm pointing out something somebody did stupidly or, yeah. or you know, oh, it just sure. it irritates you. We've got to call people out, and we've got to hold them accountable. Yeah. And uh, just like, and, and any time I say that, about somebody i'm looking in the mirror too as as just myself i mean 100%. i expect to be you if i was to. doing it wrong you got to be right call out well my thing too is like nobody wants these regulations or whatever but to not have them you need to police yourself you do you're not doing it and back you know, in the day people. when we first started it, it was it was a free-for-all and uh and there was nobody out there and 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 there, and not everybody had a side by side not everybody had a four-wheeler and you know we started taking motorcycles out and covering some more ground and stuff. And at that time, that was—is it still legal to? It is in a, in a lot of places in 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 Nevada, especially um, the BLM regulations. It's it, it's still legal for off road travel huh. in, in some of those areas. And so that, but you know, you've also got to know as a shed hunter or a hunter, if you want to have that experience of getting away from everybody. Maybe you need to not go to those areas, sure. you know, um, yeah. and because until those those regulations change, there's not much you can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. What um, uh, what's on your agenda this year for hunting? Do you have anything kind of planning? You know, I put in for about eleven different states, you, and I'll just like all of us, we'll wait by the mailbox. <laughs> and, you know, we'll 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 hopefully draw something. Um, I'm but, getting to the age now where, like, so many states, I've been. Putting in for the harder hunts. Yes. Um, you know, racked up some points. Mm-hmm. But I'm getting almost to the point where it's like, I might go for maybe not as hard a hunt to draw, just to draw it. Because just to draw. I don't want to be 78 years old and finally draw. There's a, there's a lot of wisdom to that, really. You know, I mean, a lot of people, and you know, like these these deer tags and stuff, you know, a lot of guys will save their points and they'll yeah. bank their points for mm-hmm. 20 years to draw a late season deer tag, let's mm-hmm. say in Colorado or something, yeah. fourth season. And they get there and most of the game is moved through or, the, you know, you at that time of year you get fogged in and you can't, you know, you, you all those years you banked for this one hunt. And as yeah. we all know, sometimes the conditions just aren't favorable yeah. for hunting. Exactly. Or yeah. you've had a bad winter kill. Yeah, or, bad winter kill, uh, you know, I mean, something. And, and so I'm in the camp that you hunt as often as you can in lesser units. And, Me too. and if you're a trophy hunter or meat hunter or whatever, you're going to put more more venison in the freezer and, and, and more antlers on the wall by doing that than, you know, saving that. For and that I can vouch time. for this that, I mean, even some of those, you're, I've always thought you're a dang good hunter. I oh, mean, well, thank you. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, because you produce. Yeah. And so point is, you don't have to necessarily draw those 
the best of the best every time to it, right. it just might take a little more boot work it does or or you know, whatever to, and now you know we've learned we've learned optics are, are, are amazing <laughs> right. so you know back in the day when we were young and dumb and we wore out boot after boot after yeah. boot we didn't even know how to glass yeah, and, yeah. And, and you learn how to hunt over time and, yeah. and but my biggest success I think um, was that time of field and, and right. you can't you, you can't substitute anything for that no. time of field because you learn more from your from your failures than yep. you do your success. And you have to have a tremendous amount of failures before you start seeing success and, and then it starts to click. Yeah. And uh, for me, you know, that, that happened over a period of time. So my success is just the amount of time right. that I got to spend in the field. And when you yeah. get to spend that much time in the field, you learn a lot. Yeah. And and then good things start to happen. Yeah, yeah. And and so that's that's kind of the the recipe, I would yeah, say. Yeah, I agree. That's a great, yeah. great recipe, too. Um, you were affiliated with, I know, some different magazines throughout the years, too. Yeah. And I know that's... Worked for uh, Mealy Crazy Magazine yeah, I mean, for years. And, uh, Brian and Alicia Hatch, great people. Yeah. Shout out to them. You know, they're they're good people. And, and I did uh, work for the Mule Deer Foundation publication a little bit. And uh, You just got too busy with the antlers in, right? Yeah, the antlers yeah. just kept kind of pulling me back. I did I did the show circuit. I, yeah, I yeah. promoted, you know, Muley Crazy. I did Rax calendars for years. And, mm. and I just kept kind of coming back to the, the antler side of it. And um, you kept know, you home. Kept me home. Yeah. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah. And uh, um, and then it just it kind of took hold and it turned into a really big business and and uh, here we are today so <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool yeah yeah I mean yeah. not too many people get to do yeah what you've done as far as turning your passion into but still is it it's still probably not I know it's work it is but it's still not that bad yeah <laughs> it's I I complain nobody should feel sorry for me really right. I get to see some amazing antler. Um, you know, I get to handle some things that, uh, and I still appreciate it. Um, it's not like I just look at it as a piece of meat or right. you know, dog cheese or something. Yeah. I mean, I, you get a strange this, that come in, I, you know, I appreciate, um, that natural art that antlers are. Right. And, yeah. um, and it, it still humbles me. <coughs> and so I still enjoy it. However, there's days I'm just like, Oh, if I have to, <laughs> if I have to grab another antler, right. you know, but, but that doesn't last too long. Right. And, um, you know, so I, I, I've lived a very blessed life and, um, I still I'm, got a lot of years. After I, I have, and, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to it. However, my hunting has changed as we all have, as we've become seasoned hunters. Mm -hmm. It's not so much as the, as, as harvesting an animal. It's I'm, I'm learning to smell the roses while I'm out there. Right. Yeah. The whole aspect of things that I never used to take a look at. You know, because you're just too driven Focused. on the goal. Yep, exactly. And, yep. and you're just, you know, you've got to find a great animal and, and you've got to get it done. And there's a lot of pressure and a lot of expectations. And now when I go get to spend time in the field, I don't put any expectations on me. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel sorry for some of these guys. Like, you know, when you're up filming with Hobie and mm -hmm. stuff like that, mm -hmm. the minute you draw that tag... It's, there's expectations, and right. everybody thinks that you should. So, yeah. so sometimes it's a curse rather than a, a real gift. Uh, so self that's you self said inflicted that a lot of times yeah, too. Is I that, actually had a client is. one time I was filming for, and he he said he drew super. It was a, I think it was the very first year they did super tags, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And he drew a super elk tag, and he said at the end of it, he's like, "This was almost a curse to yeah. have this tag." I, I caution guys about that, and I said, "Don't let it be a curse. Right. No. Enjoy every second of your yeah. opportunity." Yeah. Um, and, and you know what, there's, there's a lot of great bulls out there and you don't have to kill the biggest and, right. and, and you don't sweat it and don't turn it into a miserable experience. Enjoy every aspect yeah. of it. And if you go home without an animal, right. just embrace the moments that you had there. And, and so that's when I get a good tag now, um, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the, the, whether it's be, you know, uh, bugling elk or, or late season deer or, you know, seeing deer in rut or seeing elk in rut and, 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 and the things around them and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's really what I'm trying to experience right. now because I missed out on a lot of that. You know, you really do. Yeah. Yeah. You get so tunnel vision yeah. Yeah. and, um, kind and of so, self-inflicted pressure that, yeah. that you shouldn't, shouldn't do, but it, 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 happens. Happens. it happens. And especially in the industry and there's a lot of pressure to, you know, to, to continue to produce and, mm -hmm. and, um, and it really takes away from it. Especially and when so, it's limited time. It is. You yeah. Know, when it is yeah. limited time and it's like, you want to fill your tag. Yeah. So anytime somebody draws a good tag, especially a young guy, mm -hmm. I'm like, Hey, 
enjoy that. Right. Just enjoy it. And if you have success, enjoy that success too. But like said, but don't, don't dwell on it and and get out there first and foremost and, and enjoy this crazy great experience you're going to have. Yeah. And uh, especially and, like you get like a super tag. I mean, look how much you have options you have. Right. Yeah. Um, it's overwhelming sometimes. It is. Probably. It yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And uh, you know, and, and 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 you get you get into that. What everybody else is going to think. And, and oh, we yeah. shouldn't do that. That's and, no kidding. You know, and, and big game hunting isn't about a score. You know, it mm-hmm. is about the experience. And, and it's frustrating. I, I know people like that where it's all about, they, especially if they, they haven't harvested much, let's say. Right. And they put, they think they got to kill the business because that's what they see on social media. Oh, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Well, and in and every magazine and yeah. social media, it's always the biggest. Right. You don't see the the, right. the the average animals and you don't see the non-success. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You just see the premium stuff there. And it no. gives everybody a sense that everybody's killing a big animal. Yeah. Right. And they're not. Right. But you know? it's like the, I always tell people, new hunters, you know, get some things under your belt. Yep. You know, get some experience. Feel how that, that true feeling of harvesting an animal or, yeah. you know, of, 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 uh, you know, being able to watch them get that under your belt because yeah. you can't. Oh, you can't. Yeah. yeah. I, I used to spend a lot of time stalking deer that I had no intention to shoot. Ah. Right. Um, and I would do that for a number of reasons, just to see how close I could get mm-hmm. Um, and to see how the animal reacted mm-hmm. when I got there and what happened. And it was, it was training. It was, Absolutely. it was, you were learning all the time. So and I've been putting in for sheep and, and I hope I really draw. I do too. <laughs> yeah. And my full intention is to shoot it with a bow. Oh, that'd be fantastic. And yeah. what I have found, what the experience I have, which I haven't been on a lot of sheep hunts, but I remember one particular one was in Nevada where I was guiding mm-hmm. and, um, I purposely stalked a few different rams exactly like you're saying and what i found especially like those trophy species like that they don't have the pressure like elk and deer and all of they're not as tough that's why i know i could do it with a bow sure not saying i'm the greatest hunter by no means at all you'll do well yes but i know because of that that it's possible it's feasible and and um yeah i hope maybe this year I think a lot of people, you know, they don't they don't take that opportunity, that catch and release, and yeah. and um, you know, maybe working a bull and getting him in close, and a bullet you don't really plan to to hunt, but just to see how it how it goes down and see how that reaction is. You learn so much there, right? And um, and I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of guys, especially if they haven't hunted a lot, and there's this pressure, and they draw this premium tag. They don't even bother with that. You know, yeah. they, they, they just move on to the next, move on to the next. Well, yeah. when that actually comes to happen, things fall apart because Absolutely. you haven't done it enough. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, yeah. look how many animals you've probably, let's just say, take out, for example. Yeah. How many you've called in not knowing how big they are. They come in and you end up turning them down for yeah. whatever reason. Uh, but that experience to get to that point. It's priceless. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it is. It makes you, you learn something from it. You always take something the, away. Their, yeah. their uh, action, you know, how they, how they are posture, their, how they react to your call or whatever. Yeah. You know, there's, um, yeah, it's priceless. It is. And, and, and it's so fun when you do that for so long and, and it all starts to click. Yeah. And you know what that animal is going to do before it does it. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's always those surprises. But yeah. for the most part, when you really honed your skill, it 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 makes it so much easier. I know, and I so much more enjoyable. Before one of the years that I learned, I feel like really took a step up was a year I had set a goal to shoot a six point. I'd kill a few bulls, but I had a lot of opportunities calling another bull. I learned so much that year that it does take. It can move you from one level to another. If nothing else, confidence. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, because you know what your capabilities are, and yeah, yeah, confidence is a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's the whole. And there's a difference between arrogance and confidence. Yes, <laughs> for sure. I mean, you, like you said, I mean, you get to know. You have a pretty good idea what the animals are going to do. The more you, yeah, yeah. I feel pretty. You see, like it a with lot bears and yeah. antelope. For me, the two, well, mule deer too. Elk, I don't know if I've ever figured them out. <laughs> but, you know, we'll never figure them out completely. Uh, yeah. And, and, the and that's what makes it great. Yeah. It is. It is. Getting schooled, getting humbled. It's like, you know, people get frustrated. It's like, well, I mean, 
that's what they're doing for a living is trying to stay away exactly from right predators. So yeah, they're at a you shouldn't feel seven. bad about getting being you know, outsmarted by yeah. them. Yeah, you yeah. should. Yeah, I mean, you should expect it. Yeah, no, it, it, it's you know, and to be able to talk like we're talking now is is all the blood and the sweat and the tears and the years, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that seasoned hunter, you know, uh, we we do have some experience and yeah. some wisdom, and, right. and it's not been through. The success is more normally it's it's those failures absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and i mean back in the day <laughs> yeah you know we didn't have a lot of the tools that we have now the maps no. i mean i still i not that long ago i was looking at i'm sure you have them too i have huge maps that i got uh laminated sure because you've ruined other ones you know and i still have some of those that's how you used to have to do it in the right. grid and, yeah. and everything and, i'm and, still that guy i'm not a techie guy at all i'm not so very techie i got one of those gps when they first came out the the with the radio and the gps yeah. You know, oh, yeah. and and it was just a real expensive radio for me because it just ate <laughs> batteries like crazy i could never figure out how to make it honestly and i still do not know you yeah. know and so guys are saying well you know get send me a pen or you know yeah. and i'm like pen i I don't even. What are you talking about? A pick? You want a pick? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't do that. Um, I do. You know what I like to? What I use GPS and pretty much still do. Trucks here, or whatever. Camps yeah. here. Yeah. And I shot something here. Yeah. And I, how do I get back? That's pretty much. That's yeah. A, yeah. <laughs> that Nothing is against the techie stuff. No, that is helpful though. I've. There's been times that I wouldn't have found my rig in crappy weather or whatever if I hadn't had left a oh, pen. Oh, you hit! I know, I know, shed hunting. Yeah, there's been a few times you've hit some well, lizards was, out there. Well, huh? yeah, and one time I actually didn't. It was before I had ever bought one, and it was getting dark. It was raining like crazy. I had no idea where my rig was at. Yeah. I couldn't find a freaking road to save my life. I finally found a road, and I'm like, screw it. I'm just staying on this road and heading south. I knew I needed need to go south. <laughs> Yeah. It happened to be the road my buggy was on. Really? Yeah, about four miles later, but still. Very lucky. I was like, oh, because yeah. it was it rained and snowed that whole night, and I had nothing. You know, I was freezing to death, and yeah. it would have been a rough go. I, yeah. I spent a lot of nights out on the mountain unprepared, you know, army, not planning to be out there. Right. And, and, and you can do it. Yeah. Um, you know, you need the ability to make a fire right. and, yeah. and have some common sense and, and, and shut Stay it down, calm. you know, before you get too fatigued. And exactly. Stuff. But... It's never enjoyable. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, no, it was never an no. enjoyable experience. Mm -hmm. um, you survived. Shed honey, shed honey. You've done that. You've oh yeah, caught? yeah. Because I, I would imagine in the springtime you never know what. The I way. got caught one time, and and this is when I was young and dumb, and and I knew there was a big storm coming in. <laughs> Whatever. You right. Know, I, I'm going, and uh, I get back. I get uh, I get my four wheeler back in about. Oh, uh, I guess about. 10 miles, 10, 12 miles back in. I park it and I go into this wilderness area and I'm in there about eight or nine miles. And, uh, and I go to, and I just have a lean to, I always take like a rain fly for yeah. a tent, you know, and a yeah. lean to or something. And, and it starts to snow and I'm thinking, oh, this, this is, this kind of sucks, but you know, the white antler, but I'm still here to, you know, I'm going to get some big brown antler mm -hmm. and stuff. And, and, uh, it starts to snow really hard and I'm thinking, oh, well, it doesn't, when it snows this hard, it never lasts very long, right? And uh, that's the rule of thumb, you know, the big right. feather flakes. Right. It's like, oh, well, it's going to snow itself out. It's not going to. This was the 18th of April, and uh, I went to bed with about. You notice he remembers the day. Right? Oh, it was, it was. I went to bed. It was about four inches of snow on the ground, and at some point in the time of the night, my lean to it all laid down on mm -hmm. me, pushed out, and I look out, and there's about 18 inches of snow oh, down, oh. and I realized I'm not getting the my four-wheeler out of here i'm gonna to have to walk to my truck which mm -hmm. is going to be 23 24 miles and uh and then it, it continues to snow i drift off a little bit i wake up and then i can hear the wind blowing up in the tops you know and mm -hmm. stuff and i'm thinking oh, oh it's no. dark right yeah and so i've got yeah this is like three o'clock four o'clock in the morning I, <laughs> I make the decision okay either i'm going to be here for a few extra days and the snowstorms, you know, they don't, they, that snow is, the spring storms are the worst. I mean, they are the most powerful. Yeah. That snow's not going to last a long time, but it's coming in hot and heavy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you make a decision. Are you going to, are you going to ride it out, stay in there? Or are you going to, you're going to make, take, take the trip out. Yeah. And I decided I, I better get out of there. 
but the snow's so heavy and things are starting to leaf out. Mm -hmm. You can't keep a trail anymore. The trail of the stuff's down, and, mm -hmm. and so you're just following a river, and and it's just you know it's it's horrible, miserable, miserable. Yeah. <laughs> and I get all the way out, and I get to a point where either I'm going to camp or I'm going to make the last run the next day. And there's three feet, three and a half feet of snow, oh. and and I get up on top. I decide to make it out, and it's ground blizzard, and I still have you know another seven eight miles, and you're it's just that where you. That crusted hard snow oh. and and you every know, step you're sinking. Yeah, the visibility is terrible, and I'm going. I'm thinking, why do I do this? Right. You know, why do I get myself in these situations? And I'll never do this again. And yep. blah 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 blah. And I take the wrong route, and I go down a canyon. By the time I realized that I'd gone the wrong way, I'd gone about a mile out of my way, mm. and it dead ended. And I'm like, I'm not where I think I am. So I got to turn around and walk all the way back. And I literally thought at that time, I think I'm going to die out here. I mean, this is serious. Yeah. And uh, um, it was about, I uh, guess, yeah, tw 20 some hours a hike and Jeez. to get out of there. And I'm so glad to get to my truck. And, okay. and, uh, and, it, and you know, and, and you, you learn something. You learn something very valuable. Uh, maybe check the weather and make it serious. <laughs> but the other thing is, is, is uh, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get back out there. Once you heal your wounds right. and everything yeah. and, and, and that, you're How still How long does have to stay out there? Uh, for, for about another week, week and a half. And then I still had to get it across a river, which had blown up, right. you know. And, <laughs> and so you risk your life again. And you're thinking <laughs> over antlers. You know? Right. What we do for antlers. <laughs> so true. So true. That's funny. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, if you had a favorite animal, is mule deer? Definitely. Because, yeah. I, I mean, I've always... Me knowing you, when yeah, you, it always seemed like that's what the what mule deer to me is. There's just nothing more majestic than seeing a big mule deer, mm -hmm. you know, and and it's rare anymore. Exactly. Know? But when you do, you'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's burned into your mind, and uh, whether it's going over a hillside or, or you know, a mountaintop or just a fleeting second of something you see, and, and something about a truly big mule deer is. Uh, it's really kind of what keeps me going out in the hills and stuff. Yeah. And, and, and these days, they're rare. They've always been rare, but mm. they're rarer than ever. And, uh, and you know, Big Elk, you guys, you know, you're blessed to, to be in some great elk country all the time. Right. And, uh, you know, a truly big elk is, is also, again... It's a, awesome. But I, I feel like they're elk. easier to see one than a, than a trophy mule deer like yeah. that yeah the mule, sure. the mule deer they're, maybe they're that's tough. just because we're i'm where we're at i don't know but yeah no it, it is i mean i i think it's it's probably still one of the hardest you know um and it's getting, animals to obtain as far as a true trophy mule yeah. Deer. yeah and as the years go i mean like even where we live right here there used to be some sought after late hunts trophy hunts that yeah. there always was some big bucks getting killed yeah and you're not seeing that like you used to for sure you really aren't you know it used to be a guarantee that you were you were probably going to see a, a big deer on a late hunt like yeah. that you know, mm -hmm. something that you were really you know looking to, to to harvest now you know you can you can spend the whole season in, in a great situation and not see that yeah and uh, and unfortunately um you know, the, the game has changed a lot sure. and, and no longer do you, you know, you and a buddy maybe go out on one of these great tags and it seems like, you know, it's, it's you, a buddy, all their buddies, all your buddies, you know, <laughs> I mean, and you get these huge presents right, right there. Yeah. And, um, and, you sure. know, with all the technology we have, all the optics, the, the, the game cameras, the, there's just not many secrets anymore. Right. That's and, true. hundred percent. Everything is known. And, and, and I don't know that I like that, you yeah. know, um, you know, now you've got the, the infrared, yeah, oh, the, the night vision and stuff. I mean, that, that that's going to change, you know, yeah. we, we, technology is great, but at a certain point we have to kind of push back against yeah. it, I think. Yeah. It's hard to kind of swallow some of that stuff. It is. When you're, Old, I don't know, really yeah, old you're schools. old and, yeah. and, 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 but, but I think, you know, you still, it still needs to be, you know, it needs to be a hunt and, and it needs to be hunter skill that, that is, it is more of the equation yeah. than, mm. than technology. Yeah. I mean, even, even, and I'm not bagging on at all, any long range shooting, that type of thing. But, but to me, I guess that's why I like bow hunting so much. Grant, and I mean, it takes skill a certain amount of skill to make a good shot long range blah 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 but for me 
I do enjoy the the whole aspect of outsmarting and getting close. I always tell people. It's intimate. I love to get so close I can't miss, even though you can. Yes. At close it, distances. It, it happens. There's just something about getting so close and having them outsmarted. Yeah. Um, I know John has video of that antelope. We snuck up on, bedded down mm -hmm. 20 yards or less, even though it blew the shot. Yeah. It happened. blew the shot. It yeah, happened. I mean, it yeah. hit a limb, but still, it, limb, it still yeah. got blown. Yeah. But to me, just getting that close, especially antelope are so yes. tough to, to sneak up bedded. Oh, incredibly difficult. Um, that to me was a success. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just that. Yeah. It was a fun hunt. That Absolutely. was a great hunt. Well, and, and, and with, with archery hunting um, and any type of hunting, you know, taking a good shot and making a bad one, it happens. Yeah. If you've right. hunted long enough, mm. bad things are going to happen. Yep. Um, but if you take a bad shot and make a bad shot, then it's on, on you. you. Yeah. And inexcusable. Yeah. And, yeah, the, the risky shots. And that's why one thing I know there's, you know, with the long-range shooting, it's a big craze. I'm not capable of doing that, you know. I mean, the guns are capable. I just, you right. know. But a lot of people, they get this gun that's capable of doing that, but maybe they aren't capable right. of right. doing that. And it uh, gives them a false sense of, of this is easy to pull off. And, mm -hmm. you know, at those ranges, so much can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I, I had a coos deer tag in Arizona. Um, and I had a friend, because I'm not as gun savvy as, as you know, some people. Mm -hmm. I had a friend that set me up help me uh get set my gun set up and whatnot and i was you know i had a three inch group at 700 yards three bullets and he's like man you'll be able to whack one way out there i'm like no way <laughs> and he's like well, look at that group i'm like i'm on a bench there's absolutely yeah. no wind my heart rate is good yeah there's right. no horns no hair and, yeah and i set my i set my uh um goal because i archery hunted them enough yeah. i know i can get a Couple Absolutely. of three hundred yards easily. Absolutely, that's easy. Yeah, it's the archery range for especially on a coos deer. And I remember actually talking. I called up uh, 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 Chris Denham when I was down in Arizona, and he's going to try to come down and and uh, help. But um, I um, I told him I was like, man, it's, when I went down there, I set target up. It was a different ball game. Yeah, Sit for, sitting in a prone position or off a pack or something was. Totally different than a bench. Yeah. And you got wind, and you have a different uh, humidity and all that stuff. So I set my goal at 300. Like, he he made a great point. He goes, I know one thing. At 300 yards or less, it's probably going to die. <laughs> Anything beyond that, you know, too many variables can there happen. Are. Yeah. And I end up shooting at 160. Yeah. Great. I mean, I, awesome. I just thought, I can get closer. Yeah. I can get closer. Not that... I've always been that way too, partly because I'm not that good a shot. <laughs> and so, you know, I was forced to do that. And yeah. I'm not the guy that likes to go out and just punch paper. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why I kind of gravitated to archery mm -hmm. and muzzle You do a lot Yeah, of I do a lot of muzzle loader hunting. I love muzzle loader hunting. Me too. I love the fact that Idaho does a, a, a traditional type of yeah. muzzle loader. My only gripe is the bullet. Yep. If they really need to let us shoot a better bullet, yeah, um, just just for the animal, just for the sake. animal, yeah, yeah just the performance of the bullet, yeah, yep. and totally agree. and I'm okay with the loose powder, and I'm okay, you know, no scopes, and and mm -hmm. and getting out there and not knowing if the gun's gonna, you know, if they're gonna hang fire or yeah. whatever, I'm, right. I'm okay with that, but I just that holy lead bullet, yeah. is 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 a real limitation on the function of the bullet. Yeah. Right? And yep. I think it the accuracy, shoot, especially and, with elk. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you see it a lot in, yeah. out there and, and yeah. um, you know, and, and, and to make a good shot and, and, and it turns into a bad shot, um, might be some of the bullet function in, mm -hmm. in, in our muzzle loaders here in this, yeah. this state. So. I know Idaho is, is one of usually one of the last states to yeah. take up on some of these things, mm -hmm. <coughs> which I do like to a I point. I do too. I like that. But, but they, <laughs> Excuse me. You also got to come down to the the ethical point for the animal. You know, right. What's, yeah. What's it, it's such a fine line. It is because they're always so worried about. Um, and I get it. They're always so worried about. Okay. Well, if we give into this, then we're gonna have to give into that. Right. And I get that point about mm -hmm. it. But all you gotta do is stand your ground and say, okay, because of data. Yeah. You know, um, ethics wise, for the sake of the animal. Yep. You know, we need to look at other options. I'd like to see them review that. Yeah. 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 Lifelong 
muzzleloader hunter, you know, and, and uh, you've done some out of state muzzleloader hunting have, too. Yeah, right? and I've shot a lot of game over the years of muzzleloaders, and and I abide by the rules. But in Idaho, if I'm out of state, I I, I don't I won't put a scope on a gun, um, which might be stupid. Um, but I still like that traditional aspect of sure. it. Right. But I will shoot a better bullet. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and that and it does make a difference. I bet. Yeah, that's good. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I love muzzleloader hunting too. It's yeah. not that many people do it either. Yeah, you know, it's, which I it's, like. a, it's easier to draw t those tags. People are still scared of muzzleloaders a little yeah. bit. Yep. And, you know, archery is tough to get a good archery tag. It's tough to get a good rifle. Almost impossible to get a good rifle tag. Um, but that muzzleloader has always kind of still yeah. had a little window in yeah. there. Right. And you probably shouldn't uh, say this either, but you get to hunt during the, the – well, for mule deer, I drew, I've drawn – three mule deer muzzleloader tags and they're right during the rut and stuff yeah. and i love that oh it's, it's great <laughs> and yeah. they have some good rifle uh or muzzleloader elk hunts too that are in september yeah they do. yeah the bull yeah. I sh i've drawn one muzzleloader elk tag and that was right well it was october 1st but it seems like they're rutting later oh, yeah, they are fishing. later so yeah. that was fine it worked out good yeah yeah. But again, I shot a bull, and with that bullet, he should have died right away. He did die. Right. I had to wait till the next day. Yeah. And he was right there where I left him standing. But um, yeah, but it it does. Yeah, I you know I it it, it causes some doubt. I've seen you know and you're never gonna get a, it's the other thing you're never gonna get an exit wound with a muzzle. Wound. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and you're and so you're never gonna get a great blood trail. And right. So you That's need so that true. bullet to function yeah. right. well and stay together That's a really good and point. do the that things is a good it needs point. to do because you know with the, with most of the time with a bow those things are so fast and you know you get a good shot mm -hmm. and you'll get a pass it through yeah. and mm -hmm. and with a rifle you know same type of deal yeah. but with a muzzle loader I've shot a ton of game and it never goes out the other side it's it's a lot of times it's on the hide on the outside and mm -hmm. slap back yeah, you know I'm but, but yep. you do not get that extra that extra ex hole that. i know one thing that i um and i have a muzzle over on it but and i think it's a great option though mm -hmm. i mean I've, as long as i can archery hunt but i've always said if, when i can't archery hunt anymore i think i'll probably yeah gravitate to that um is how important it is to and i don't think a lot of people realize to get a load, a correct load for muzzle loader, I don't. I think people sometimes. Yeah. I've talked to people and they just think, oh, you just put the powder in there, put the bullet in there, but the patch thickness and all those different things makes plays such a different role in. Yeah, yeah, and and you know everybody's got the speed loaders and stuff now, and, yeah. and and the other problem with that is you know the pellets is one thing, but you know, excitement. And yeah. if, you've, if you've made a shot and whatever, I mean, and you still got to get that loose powder in yeah. that, and you got to get it all in there. You've pre-measured it out, but yeah. I don't know how many times I've, it runs down the side of my yeah, hand, and then you're like, like, oh, boy. This exactly. Is, <laughs> well, now what? Uh, one of the reasons I had to leave that bull overnight, too, was I had shot him, and then um, I grabbed a speed loader to reload because I was able to get it back up on him again. I grabbed an empty one. Well, not paying attention. I freaking thought I filled my... with powder and i shoved the bullet down in there and i couldn't get the bullet out i yeah so i had to come back the next day i mean he was dead right there but it happens you yeah it's kind of funny and i guess if you don't get excited then exactly you know, fortunately for me i've always been the type of guy that i i, I remain pretty calm and cool until after the shot yeah, yeah. and then it's like the adrenaline yeah. really comes in but yeah. i've got buddies that are the other way around yeah. And I'm like, wow, that is a really debilitating yes. issue. Yes. Right? And uh, I never know. pay attention, try to pay attention, and I may get pretty excited too. I know I do sometimes, but I guess it's a matter of letting that control you. Mm -hmm. it, and, but after the shot, good luck. I yeah, mean, yeah, that's all. I missed a bull one time. I remember my range and, and my range finder having problems with it. But after I missed the bull, I ranged it with one hand first. Mm -hmm. Missed the bull. And when it come time to range it again, I had to use both hands and set my <laughs> elbows down because I was just like. Rrr. But that's fun, that you know. I mean, that's yeah. Set up you didn't get excited, I don't get excited right? Excited yeah, about. right. So, yeah. Anyway, well, yeah. I really enjoy you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come in and yeah. and talk to you guys. Catch and up with you. I, you know, it's interesting. Like you said, we're going to have a conversation, and we really did go over here. <laughs> there. I, I thought maybe we'd be a little more earmarked on on yeah. antlers, but right. um, but this has been a real treat. It has. You know, good, yeah. Um, so. Well, you got a lot of good story. Like I says, I've we always admire admire your it. your hunting skills. Well, likewise, and yeah. As you well know. as yeah, your experience in uh, 
with the shed hunting. Yeah. Perfect time, you know, we got shed season going to be starting here pretty soon. It is, yeah, and, and hopefully, you know, people have that cabin fever and they want to get out and the weather, when the weather gets nice, but let's best all just to... be real mindful exactly. of, of what we're Absolutely, pursuing. Yeah. yeah. And the best way to get a hold of you is? Yeah, probably my my, my cell phone, um, you know, which is 208-539-9265, and uh, you can look us up online, bonafideantlers.com, but... Uh, yeah, just shoot me a text. And like I said, I, I put a I put a, a, a invite to anybody out there. If you're an antler enthusiast, we may be busy, you know, it may, whatever, but you're more than welcome to come in and walk through there and, and see the place. It's really something to see. It is. And, and I encourage people to stop by and see it, especially if you've got friends or family in town and you're like, hey, That's you want to see something cool? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you're more than welcome anytime. Anybody sure. is. Yeah, and, yeah we'll um, get some video. It's fun probably throw a little video on this yeah. uh, with the podcast don't you think john maybe or i was just thinking we'd just do a whole tour and do a whole video of that i think that would be <laughs> cool be a great idea yeah. yeah maybe show the process if you would yeah mind. yeah you know some of that's a little okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. little so, secret that's you know, fine stuff. That's, but, i totally uh, get that yeah but what yeah. you can just but absolutely yeah i'd love to have you guys over anytime okay, like cool. I said, you know it. super uh, cool it's been a real pleasure right, right ron thanks yeah, very yeah much. thanks for coming thanks for having me forward to having you again we'll yeah Maybe Anytime. Maybe some hunts and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck with this. Like I said, the season Thanks. hunter, I, th I think it's a great angle. And uh, I love it. Good. good. Thanks. Awesome. Appreciate, it. Appreciate you, man. You <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks to all the subscribers. See you guys. Talk to you later. <laughs>